next one up, we are on time and are going back to back. I'm so happy. Thank you so much, Wes, for joining. Um, we've met at, I think, maybe various DSI events yes. throughout uh, the last year. And you are building really like a wonderful backbone infrastructure of really many of the things that many people here um, are working on. And so I think, you know, we're really getting into the infrastructure now in this kind of like latest session yeah. where, you know, from tech tree to like actually to make this work. Um, I think uh, it's a really nice trajectory. So thanks a lot for joining. We, I heard a lot about DSI, a lot about DSI, and now you're gonna do what is next. Thanks a lot yeah. for joining and the stage is yours. Thank you so much. Um, well, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Wes Lloyd. I'm from uh, Protocol Labs. And as Allison mentioned, we're very passionate about building infrastructure. And my own passion is centered around decentralization. So the talk today will be uh, a bit of a survey of what's happened in decentralization, what's going on right now, uh, really to ask you to think about your own area of expertise and how decentralization might benefit your area. Because it's not just economics, it's really moving into a lot of different domains and so this is this is sort of the goal of talk but it was uh it was very funny timing two weeks ago to start writing a talk about decentralization uh there was some uh major news that occurred that, uh... <laughs> so so as i'm prepared to tell you about the benefits of decentralization uh we should probably start by talking about the, the elephant in the room uh there was a massive loss of trust in decentralization talk about the the negative and the positive of that but let's just go ahead and call it out guys um <laughs> tom brady and giselle were uh were sued for their involvement in a in a crypto exchange so obviously trust was lost um but uh but this is part of the whole story that we'll build out in a minute the pros and the cons um it's a powerful <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Perhaps falsely accused. Um, and so, yeah, so broad history of decentralization, what's going on right now. So a little bit about the technology that we're trying to build to empower this movement, because Solidity smart contracts are extremely powerful and more to be done. A little brief background about me. Half of my, my working career was in the traditional enterprise world, doing uh, analytics, public cloud architecture. But the, the kind of the moonlighting I was doing was in crypto. So I was very passionate about crypto. This is 2013. You can see the last, one of the earlier crypto winners post uh, China uh, uh, outlawing uh, crypto. So it's not, it's not the only crypto winner that we're going to go through. Uh, so better. And then uh, mining, and then also working with some of the um, decentralized exchanges, doing grant work and things like that. But now I look at Protocol Labs and we're building out two specific projects around crypto infrastructure that we hope we're going to power a lot of new decentralized ecosystems. And so just to give uh, folks that are not in the space a bit of a framework to think about what are some of the important traits of decentralization, the word trustless will often be used. Um, I also like the term trust in math and economic incentives because we still place a lot of trust when we put money in crypto systems. Um, one great term that I heard uh, quoted was uh, reducing the trust needed for a given mode of cooperation, so the fluidity, reducing friction required. Um, everything that you could be doing will be as much publicly verifiable as possible, so don't take my word for it. You know, see the results of what we're doing publicly. Um, and then there's also different degrees of identity. Pseudonymity, meaning um, instead of being less, I might be robot1234, and I always act as robot1234 online, and that's my pseudonymous uh, identity. Uh, sometimes full anonymity if you're working in, in uh, ZK Snark systems. But I think very important to hear is this aspect of ownership and control being transferred from the institutions to, to the individual. It seems to be a common thread in a lot of these systems. A sort of democratic empowerment through crypto uh, incentives. And so um, this is, you know, if we zoom all the way past in the internet and BitTorrent, there were a lot of decentralized systems that were very impactful. But one of the first to add economic incentives become very popular was this publishing of the Bitcoin white paper. And this person, this uh, pseudonymous person, Satoshi Nakamoto, said, hey, I've developed this new peer-to-peer e-cash system. They were not using the term decentralized as much back then. Peer-to-peer was, was the, the term of the day. Give it a try, look at the screenshots, and, uh, and I've written this paper here. So what's really powerful about this is that in the Genesis block, meaning the very first block within the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem, you can put um, uh, 
you can, you can embed a certain amount of text in your transaction. And there was a phrase here that says, the Times, January 9th, 2009, Chancellor on the brink of bailout of the banks of England. Um, and it was sort of a referendum on the existing power structures, in this case, the, um, the federal, uh, federal banking system. Uh, there were bailouts as a cause of the financial crisis. So this is, I think, just sort of an interesting mark of, of this system, in some sense of its soul, is meant to be a check on the existing institutions, take that power that existed in the Federal Reserve System, and, and move it to the individuals. Another interesting uh, development was in 2014, Vitalik Buterin. This was his promo video for the, uh, the Ethereum network, which was going to be this global computer system. Um, it's hilarious to go back and watch the original video because it seems almost too ambitious to be true. But it turns out it is true. And this is an example here of what most of the crypto world is focused on today. Solidity smart contracts. It's a very powerful primitive. You can build entire, entire industries have been built on this. Most of the crypto work we do today is built on these concepts. Um, but it's not the end because even though solidity contracts are extremely powerful, um, people that come from the Web2 space or traditional IT are used to very complex and robust compute systems with sophisticated databases and running a website on, on the computation. But you cannot do that through a smart contract. So there's a bit of a technology development opportunity in the Ethereum space. And obviously, we talked about some of the peer to peer protocols. These are growing in tandem with the decentralized system. One in particular here is IPFS. This is a technology we work with often in protocol labs, which is peer to peer file sharing. That's an important part of, of the ecosystem. Um, there's a rich history of decentralized autonomous organizations. Uh, many of you involved in crypto have heard of the DAO, which was a first attempt at uh, crypto organizations. Failed spectacularly. There was a hack in the smart contracts. Um, much like Tom and Giselle, people lost a lot of a lot of faith in the in the ecosystem, and people bailed out at the time. But there were people that said, maybe we can do this better. Maybe we'll rebuild it. One of the resilient things about this community is, even though in the face of massive failures, there are people that say, we're just going to still keep trying. And there was this group here called Mollet DAO, a lot of folks based out of Colorado, who said, we're going to build a DAO organization, and we're going to keep it moving forward. And as a result of their work, there were many other DAOs that we know today that are extremely successful. There were groups like Bancor, who were some of the first decentralized exchange protocols, Compound, Maker, Uniswap. A lot of their origins and foundations came from the work that the Mollet DAO and the Meta Cartel Ventures folks did. And in fact, if you go to MCON, it's a conference that happens every year in Colorado, it's a great gathering of people that have been in the DAO space for a long time. So let's talk about some of the, the things that we can define as successes here. So when you think about decentralization, what is the market cap of this? What successes have we had in this case? Well, at the height of the last market, it was up to $200 billion of uh, market cap in the DeFi space. This is across all the different decentralized protocols brought together. And if you think about, in comparison, what the pro some of the problems that people were trying to solve by offering this as an alternative, there was a lot of passion during the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. But at the time, those people didn't have an alternative to step away to. Whereas now, in the decentralized finance space, they're starting to form alternatives. And I believe the traditional financial system uh, market cap is maybe $30 trillion, something like that today. DeFi is maybe $200 billion at its peak. So it's less than 1% of an impact, but it's starting to build steps towards alternatives for people to freely choose, choose exits and maybe empower some of the, the democratic choices that we'd like to see. And I use this term. Decentralized digital, digital asset, asset ownership, ownership because really an NFT is a pointer to some information that exists that you, that you claim to have ownership over when you own the NFT. Um, there were a lot of popular uh, authorizations with artists, maybe artists that were in third world countries that had the opportunity to um, to own uh, to earn income uh, previously. This was enabled by the NFT technology. It was uh, very often as a political uh, technology to so empower folks like. Um, uh, Julian, Julian Assange, Assange and their defense, defense uh, uh, team. So it's, it's, it's kind of a great lightning, uh, like rallying cry for, for these political movements, um, even, even though it's just a full um, um, JPEG technology in, in, in some of its ways, if you were to like sort of minimalize it. So lots of lots of, of uh, impact going there. DSI, uh, in the traditional scientific community and experience there. But this is a very robust ecosystem. If you have not had an opportunity to um, 
spend time in the decentralized science ecosystem, I highly recommend looking at some of the upcoming events, in particular DSUN happening uh, in January. These are folks who are taking uh, the traditional academic uh, systems and they're trying to rebuild them in individual research. I was not aware of the nuances of how researchers have to work with or against the university to own the, the rights of their work and how they have to do various publications and all these other systems. So this is trying to flatten democratize that for the researcher. And then last year, decentralized media. Um, I a highly political topic, what social media is great, which, uh, which social media is not good for society. The nice thing is that you've got folks like from the Ave Protocol who are founding a group called Lens. You've got Jay Krebs, who was um, a result of Jack Dorsey's work at Twitter with Blue Sky, both in their own social media uh, embody all the principles of decentralized technology. So you own your data, you own your file, you can monetize it if you want, but at the end of the day, it's, it's control from a technology organization to the individual. And then a few other interesting things here, decentralized public funding. Gitcoin is a good example of this with quadratic funding. Great work on hyper certs, taking uh, what is, uh, you know, pro bono donations and turning it into um, more sophisticated ways of back people to benefit from uh, any sort of technology that you're investing in. So um, there's also been some challenges. <laughs> Not quite on, on the point there. Um, this, is, uh, this is a picture of the most recent issue here. And this is, I think, an example of a person where the difference between decentralized systems and centralized systems. If you're in the crypto space, that's a big difference. But if you're not in the crypto space and in the public, it's a problem because it just looks like crypto in general. So there's a loss of faith there that we have to overcome. Um, so like there's capital, uh, similar challenges there. And even within the crypto space, folks like uh, folks like Doquan here, who founded Luna and Terra, where there are systems that might have had some degree of legitimacy and positive intent, but in bear market turn out to crash and it causes other major systemic failures as well. Um, so, uh, and then the, the last piece here is even within fully or hacks, uh, this is an example of a massive hack that lost, I think, $300 million in a, in a wormhole um, bridge. Um, so these systems are not perfect yet. Hopefully, I would like to think that they are anti-fragile in the sense that as they are hacked, the next generation is a little bit better and a little more uh, resistant. So, so what are some of the lessons here that we can take away? The first is... Um, centralized on ramps to decentralized systems are not the same as uh, they're not the same. They're, they're different systems. And the last one here is um, is that there is creative destruction, and over time, hopefully, this can lead to stronger, more robust crypto systems. The failures that we had of uh, Mount Gox in 2013 are not the same exact failures that we're having today. The world is learning to be a little bit more suspicious, and hopefully, there's a more uh, robust ecosystem for decentralization generally. But at the same time, we have to be cognizant of uh, consumer protections in the individual countries that we, we operate in. Their legislators are going to care, and they're going to want to raise these um, as concerns. So opportunities for the future, and people are inspiring the next of decentralization. This is a picture of the cloud computer in East Mexico talking about decentralized identity. So you can take your identity with you in different places, and a lot of folks talking about that. Public goods funding, quadratic funding, and also impact ideas, generalizing the way that we reward people for their activity on chain. Decentralized society, Pooja just gave an excellent talk about lots of depth of what that means to be a decentralized society. And hopefully that's an area that we can grow as well. Uh, Biology training of Austin, just uh, met with the Foresight Institute not long ago and gave a great talk about the network state and what this means. Um, again, I think this conceptualization of the network state is going to require more decentralized systems than we have today, uh, meaning we have Discord and Telegram, but those systems are hacked, they go down, they're not owned by the individual. In order to embody some of the, the best benefits of what Balaji is sort of envisioning this, we're going to need more tech that is decentralized. And so that's where we spend a lot of our time. Uh, we have sort of two projects. One is Bacalhau, which is the Portuguese word for uh, salted codfish, compute over data. It's, uh, it's a play on the term there. 
And the other is a working group because there are many other projects beyond our project that are trying to solve the same problem. And we want to raise all of those projects up, give them visibility and awareness because there's lots of folks that are trying to build Web3 systems, but they're forced to use systems like AWS today. They would love better decentralized alternatives if they could exist. Um, and just to give a one minute, just uh, sort of a little deeper dive here, if you're not a, a, a deep compute uh, IT person, this is what the Amazon website looks like today. If you're going to build a website or a service, you have plenty of lovely choices to choose from. You've got storage components, you've got compute components, you can do services like databases, and then you build your application on top of that. And that's how much of the world hosts their system today. What our hope is, is that we can rebuild these using decentralized technology. So that we'll use things like IPFS and Filecoin, the lowest layer here. We'll have various projects and implement different types of compute. And then things like machine learning, AI, uh, DAOs, they can build these social media, they can build decentralized messaging apps to give those people robust tools to build the next generation technologies. And then one last uh, plug here, this is actually a, uh, a grant that we have open. If anybody is involved in the impact evaluator space or hyperserve space, this is live on the ceramic web and it's an opportunity um, for folks to apply for a grant to actually build out impact evaluators using ceramic and back. It's using decentralized technology to re reward people for the work they're doing entirely off chain. And so that's all the content that I have for today. I would love to end uh, opening it up to the crowd because I love the wisdom of this group and to, to think about your impacts on future systems and to think about things like which social systems we have today that should be rebuilt. Uh, are there limits to what we can do with separation? Have we limits for them and get to? Um, are there risks of technology in some ways too powerful? Is it the, is the atom bomb that we need to be careful with? Uh, but most importantly, who's gonna take care of common design? <laughs> Thank you guys. All right. <laughs> I think Bill Belichick is a great man that we're living here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes, I know. That was tough. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a, that was a massive um surprise to a lot of folks in crypto, even. I think the events that happened with uh with Sam Bankman Freed, um, I know our CEO was surprised. It was interesting to hear from the VCs that had tried to pitch Sam Bankman Freed and their experience of like, you know, getting pushed back, like don't don't look too close under the covers and things like that. Um, it's tough because sometimes technology moves faster than the um, the laws can move, the, like in a given country. So you see a lot of dynamism in the technology space, but but the the legal structures are going to lag behind. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I'm hopeful the U.S. can continue to be uh, at least an uh, open centric model for uh, for collaboration. So that's we can. Maybe your topic there at the end of, of some of the boundaries that we're up against. I, I disagree that comes in the form of governance and consensus models. We just haven't found the silver bullet yet um, in that area. I think once we can find consensus models that really do work, to, like especially in Dallas, there's, there's not the same participation. We're lucky to get 10% participation in the um, so, so I think that's one boundary. If, if we can come up with a, a, a reputable system taking consensus. Do you, do you think that uh, participation has anything to do with um, recognition of people's contributions, like giving them proper recognition or something else that's, that's holding back people's involvement in that? It's, it's a good question. No one really knows why it, it starts low and then gets lower over time. So it's, it's unfortunate. Well, I, I, think, that, I, I think that um the ground we should now for the reputation and utility over token and utility is investing to the other people in the balance of power and that. And I think a lot more down in the ocean now, just more ocean for the health, just the top five. I think they've given up the token and well, yeah, we just did talk about it. But yeah, the generative system, it's emerging. So as you were saying, as things come to light, that's the right word, generating ones. It's very yes. ephemeral. Yes. That would seem to be more selective. Like, let's open up the gates, everyone joins in, get us to work, and then you realize that the of labor isn't always going to include everyone. Yeah, and also, like, 
is like having having an idea about doing something isn't the same as doing something. And I think like a lot of DAOs fall victim to this. I think there's like really good examples of like DAOs that use like voting like constantly and their active members are constantly voting and invariably these I think turn out to be some of like service DAOs. And I mean, cause like maybe the contractors or people providing a service, but like, you know, for them, maybe they get paid or like, you know, whatever they need to do on a daily basis is like tied in very intimately with like the voting architecture. So they like do it regularly. But um, generally I see this, this kind of yeah, bloat happens when maybe there's a, a, like maybe a lot of good ideas and good intentions, but then it's like hard to like coordinate on specific things, hard to like delegate because there's not that like same pressure um, in the organization. That's a great call. Are there any DAOs you've seen that you think are very good examples that are like sort of are examples of good coordination or? Like single out like service DAOs and as just a category. So, you know, there's like uh, raid guilds, Dior, a few other like organizations like this. And again, I think because they just have like this very constrained environment that's very business like, you know, like, that, like for them, voting is part of the business. Um, but I think maybe some of those principles could like carry over to like different types of DAOs as well. Incentivization of uh, governance is working in the United States. First, we were penalizing for not getting involved in governance. It didn't work. And at the point where we were starting to solve, we call it civilian policy. So you have civil rights and civil duties. And so you have this sharp duty of the same. Are there technologies you guys use that have been successful, like Coordinate or Snapshot or anything? I uh, use Clarity and uh, Snapshot. Uh, you know, Clarity is kind of a notion that you have automated uh, content, which is good for like challenging people to use visual sheets. So if you want to give some uh, access to some technical parameters, that you want to write the content. Then you can actually go to the joke down, you mint a certain amount of tokens instantaneously on there, and they're on the poly energy and the rest of the um, And then you can allocate those um, tokens exactly to the people who are going to vote. So if you have a, yeah, so if you have a sub guild, for example, say, um, say trying to give a tech chain, and, and you only want the team giving the tech chain to vote for a certain governance. Then you can use joke style because then and then because then the vote is is isolated basically to the people who have the reputation to vote in that particular procedure. And then it doesn't it doesn't it also doesn't um, impact your own your own, your own tokens that you allocate for the style. It's it's a great tool. I think I think the I think the name has done it as a service. I don't think people understand that joke style. Uh, you mentioned Dezo and Lens and all those kinds of distributed social media, there's also Forecaster and other options. Um, but the truth is, when you look under the hood of their usage metrics, they're not great. They don't, they don't look good. Uh, so my question is, will people ever actually care about decentralization? And if they will, how do we, how do we make them care? That's such an interesting topic. <laughs> It's such a great topic. So do people care about decentralization? Essentially, because even I was I was meeting with some of the heads of um, these large decentralized exchanges like uh, Gnosis and uh, Aave and some of the other folks and asking like, well, we're using centralized infrastructure today. Is it, a, is it a problem for you? And they said, our users don't care. They're looking for liquidity, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it fluctuates over time how much people care about centralization. Like um, obviously like when Bitcoin first came out, the decentralized aspect was, was a big deal. 
But now, like, as regulatory situations change, then maybe it becomes more interesting. Like, if you live in China or another place where uh, crypto is more, like, clamped down and you want to have a voice, maybe then decentralization matters more. Decentralized identity matters more and things like that. So I think it'll be a bit of a policy. Like, policy will have some impact on it as well. So specifically in terms of, like, the, cons the problem is the consumer standpoint. If it's hosted on Filecoin or AWS, it's just not really a different experience. So I don't think there's a big view towards that. But one way that I see decentralizing the whole social graph being a high utility function is what we saw with gaming. Minecraft and Roblox, two of the most successful games ever, was really the decentralization of the internal social network uh, ability to build on top of the core substrate. And I don't think we've seen that with social. So it's less of the decentralization of the core fundamental mechanic, but more so the decentralization of the social graph, different from what kind of Lens is doing, which is different applications can be built in different places. But I think with like what Roblox has, which is one portal to many different worlds. If something like Instagram had this, TikTok would have never become a thing. Uh, because someone from the Instagram community would have uh, obviously gone and figured to build that thing. And I think there's plenty of things that can come from that. I see this as the future of what mobile video will become. You know, it's gonna be at least five years before we go headset mode versus uh, engaging with it in this one. And I think there's like so many ways that you can add beyond you know, these AR filters or new dance trends, trends of actually new ways to interact with information, uh, the ability to test different algorithms, specifically like empowerment algorithms I'm super interested in. We basically have like demons on the web right now, uh, sucking our souls. The engagement algorithm wants to maximally uh, just keep you doing nothing but engaging with it. What if we created once, which tried to optimize, giving you a feeling of uh, excitement and motivation. And so that's one thing I'm working on that I was interested in reflecting over it. Mm -hmm. So, so just building up on what you said, like it seems like there's like, something like that. Um, so, so just building up on what you said, like there seems to be something like what happened to axes around like flexible usability and like decentralized trust. And it would sound like flexible usability might have a new way to be but like 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 centralized uh, like centralized construction of flexible usability. Could probably instill out of the decentralized system or something, and that might not be that optimistic for like decentralized trust. It's a, it's a great question of why didn't that scenario already happen organically with um, with Instagram and Facebook? Why didn't they open their graph? Why doesn't why don't they let me bring my own algorithm to my data set to say I want to recommend data that makes me feel positive, positive body image, or positive, you know, versus like just being really addictive. And I wonder how much like the, the economic models of just traditional capitalists, I'm a company I have to make profit, affect the technical designs, openness versus closed nature, versus like in the crypto and the decentralized space, when you have different economic incentives, does that then sort of like seed for that? Yeah. I think some of it is a like, cultural progression as well, is we've essentially unleashed like a form of cigarette and we don't have all the data or kind of the cultural defense mechanism to see that thing as low status. So it's not like a cigarette became less addictive uh, for them to have a massive decrease in use. It's simply the status symbol changed. So the same way I think we've just had somewhat of a health revolution for the past decade as well, and it's high status that help foods consume better stuff for our brain. Uh, content is no other. You're hanging out with certain information, which is firing your neurons and changing them permanently. And I think just we wake up to the whole uh, you know, effect that that's truly having on us. Who were you, you're, you're, who you hang out with online, or you're up, like your five friends. Well, uh, engagement algorithms is just like a nice Karen. It doesn't care about you, will never change. Like, it doesn't care about you. Just a very toxic relationship to have in your life. Yeah. What, what you're saying with the economic structure, I think it's from valuing proprietary information versus Provenance. So if we're shifting that value system from, you know, in the capitalistic or it's proprietary. So yeah, I own it, therefore I get the value out of it, not you. Right? Whereas provenance, you're like, oh, 